Okay. Welcome uh, to the CHS Alliance Sphere and URD webinar on accountability, ethics, and COVID-19. I'm Jules Frost, the head of programs and partnerships at the CHS Alliance. Thank you all so much for joining us today. At the moment, we still have people coming online, but it, it looks like there are 200 participants and we're expecting nearly 500 today. So thank you all for taking your time out uh, during a busy schedule uh, to be with us. Today, um, we will spend the next hour together um, on the topic that I highlighted, and I'm going to spend the first five minutes with an introduction and some housekeeping items. Then we will have a discussion with Q&A &Q over uh, a 45-minute session, and then we'll have some closing remarks. In order to facilitate our discussion today, um, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned, the webinar is scheduled for a total of one hour today. You will notice as you come online that all attendees are muted. That is in order to facilitate the panel discussion without interruptions. Thank you so much to those that submitted questions when you registered. Uh, we have taken those into consideration and we'll try to weave them into our discussion. However, if you haven't answered or posed questions yet, um, there is an option. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a little section called Q&A. During uh, the panel discussion, you are free to add Q&A there. And I would ask if it is a question, please put it there versus the chat box. The chat function is a way that we can communicate uh, with you. Um, and you can communicate with other participants um, on the session here. But predominantly, if you have any issues, uh, you can chat with us there. Lastly, we will be using the polling feature to ask you a few introductory questions so that we could get to know a little bit about who's online with us today. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to mention we will be recording this session and I will ensure that we distribute it to those that are participating today and we may distribute it more widely. With that, I'd like to ask my colleague to go ahead and launch our poll. You can see this here on your screen and you can go ahead and click your answer and when you're finished, I think you just have to push submit. And once we see that the amount of answering is finishing up, we will end the poll and share the responses with you. Looks like people are getting involved. Thank you so much. I'm very interested in what your superpower might be. <laughs> Excellent. Right now we've got about 40% of you have voted. Hopefully you can find out how to do this. Sometimes if you're not familiar with Zoom, it can be a little complicated. Seems a lot of people would like to be able to fly. <laughs> So we have nearly 260 people online and a good percentage of you have voted. I'll go ahead and give us another 30 seconds on voting and then we'll move forward. If you can scroll down, you'll see there's four questions in total. Okay, Genevieve, why don't we go ahead and post, great, the shared results. So 217 of you were able to vote. Um, as you may be able to see here, flying is the superpower most people would like to have today. We have people from around the world um, with 20% in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you for joining in a time zone that might not be best for you. 
And as you can see, Europe, um, we've got about half of us based here. Um, and then let's look at the breakdown further. Uh, as far as who you represent, we've got a good percentage of international NGOs, national NGOs, some from the academia world, as well as the UN and government. Great. And we hope we can fulfill your expectations that your knowledge will be built up. And I'm pleased to see most people aren't here because their boss made them come today. So, okay, we can take down the poll and um, then go ahead and uh, let's see. Genevieve, let's see if we can get that off the screen. Great. Okay, so I'd like to now introduce um, our moderator for today. I'm pleased to introduce um, our highly accomplished moderator, uh, Heba Ali. Named by the New African Magazine, one of the 100 most influential Africans of 2018, Heba runs the world's only news organization dedicated to reporting about humanitarian crisis. This is called the New Humanitarian. Formerly known as IRA News, the New Humanitarian is an independent nonprofit newsroom that produces journalism from the heart of conflicts and disasters. Heba, a multimedia journalist by training, spent a decade reporting from conflict zones in the Middle East, Africa, and Central Asia before joining the team that led IRA's spinoff from the United Nations. I'd like to encourage you, following our time together today, to take some time to listen to her TED Talk, Stop Eating Junk News, which drives home the importance of responsible journalism from crisis zones. With that, I'd like to hand over to Heba. Heba, thank you uh, for moderating for us today. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone, and thanks for that introduction, Jules. And as many of you probably know, the new humanitarian's work seeks to amplify the voices of those who are affected by crises and hold the aid industry accountable. So this topic is uh, dear to my heart and I'm, I'm very happy to be steering the conversation. The, this topic of putting people at the center must be one of the sector's most favorite things to talk about. Um, but it's not always clear to me exactly what uh, everyone means when they use that term. And so for the purposes of today's conversation, uh, I think we're talking about how aid agencies are accountable to the people they serve, how they consult the people they serve and integrate their feedback into programming, and how international aid agencies in particular can make space for local ownership of a response, which is of course all well and good, and, and I think the sector is coming along in some of those areas. But COVID-19 is, as everyone knows, a very unique crisis in which um, international aid workers have crises in their own countries to deal with, uh, can't be on the ground uh, or directly in touch with the communities they're serving, and face stark ethical choices. Um, and I think we've all seen the drama unfolding in places like Italy, but there are you know, a handful of ventilators in South Sudan. So the ethical choices in um, the context in which many humanitarians are working are uh, quite different, I think, than the ones that the West has faced in this crisis. So what do good ethics look like in a context like this? And how do you engage affected communities um, in these very difficult ethical questions at a time of social distancing? Um, how are you getting community feedback and maintaining the trust that's so needed in these kinds of crises when you can't engage with communities face to face? Um, and finally, what does this crisis mean for the localization agenda, which is um, meant to be at the heart of this people-centered approach? So we're going to try to tackle those three issues, ethics, engagement, and localization, through the COVID-19 lens, while there's still a short window of opportunity to shape the way the sector responds to this crisis. Um, I don't have to state the obvious, but I, I will. Uh, we've seen the results very recently of what happens when um, an epidemic doesn't, um, the response to an epidemic doesn't take into account community uh, feedback uh, and isn't accountable to the people it's meant to serve. And I'm talking of course about Ebola in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's great actually that we have Jonas here from DRC today, um, but the, the consequences there were drastic enough we are uh, hoping today to learn some lessons that can be applied in the case of COVID to avoid making 
some of those same mistakes at a much, much bigger scale with even more catastrophic consequences. So um, I'm going to kick things off with uh, Hugo, um, who probably needs no introduction with this crowd, but I will, uh, I will give one anyway. He is, as we all know, a leading authority on the ethics of war and humanitarian aid, and his career has combined academia with diplomacy with operations. He's just finished a five-year stint as head of policy and humanitarian diplomacy at the International Committee of the Red Cross and has now gone back to the safety of academia as a senior research fellow at the Institute of Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict at the University of Oxford. Um, and perhaps uh, among the many books he has authored, I'll just mention this one, uh, Humanitarian Ethics, A Guide to the Morality of Aid in War and Disaster. So um, from your ethical standpoint, Hugo, um, I'd love to get your, your thoughts. To start with, maybe uh, last month you wrote an opinion piece for us at the New Humanitarian called this age of COVID-19 demands new emergency ethics. Um, and we'll try to drop some links into some of the, the resources I'm referencing, but um, could you define for us, Hugo, accountability in the context of this particular crisis? What is that new culture of emergency ethics that this moment demands of us? Yes, absolutely, Heber. And welcome to everyone who's joined. Lovely to see so many people. I think the first critical ingredient of accountability in a big pandemic like this must be honesty. So we must have leaderships who are honest about the problem, honest about the choices that their societies face and government faces. Um, we know very well from the pandemic of HIV, which was the last big pandemic, that governments who were honest immediately about the problems spoke directly about causes, sexual transmission, vulnerable groups, etc had a much better track record of responding. The second key ingredient must be regular communications between government, peoples, communities, and aid agencies. And regular communication must be two-way. It's not just government sending messages about what to do, what's happening, etc. It's about really listening to community experience. What does lockdown mean? What would a flexible lockdown look like, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. What are they going through? Um, and how relevant is the, is the aid response. So regular communication. The third element of accountability in the COVID crisis must be equity. We must try and have as fair a response and reach as we can. Uh, we know already from Chicago that 70% 70, 70 of deaths in Chicago were from the African-American community, and that's because they are more vulnerable. So we have to find ways to really design an equitable response that reaches out fairly across all parts of society. Um, we need a good discussion about what's right, what's wrong. We need everybody joining in a discussion about, okay, I'll stay at home a bit because I understand the reason, um, but I can't stay at home forever, et cetera, et cetera. We need a public discussion. And finally, we, we need to realize that, you know, people have rights, right to health, right to work, right to education that continue through a pandemic, but we also have duties. So we must be accountable for things we must do um, to not spread the virus, to support our local community, to engage and to be responsible um, as individuals in a crisis. And from what you've seen so far in the response to COVID-19, is that description that you've just outlined being met or is the response ethical so far or put otherwise maybe what's missing in the current humanitarian ethics that this crisis is exposing? Well, I'm going to answer yes and no to that because I think, yes, a lot of the response is ethical so far. We are seeing, you know, across the Western world where it's in China, where it's been worst hit so far, we are seeing governments trying to come up with responsible prevention methods, which sadly at the moment are social distancing and um, sheltering at home, etc. Trying to do that um, and giving clear arguments and honest explanations and trying to bring people with them and to get society and people's consent to work collectively for the common good. That's all very good and we are seeing that. We're also seeing a lot of governments really stepping into mitigating measures because we know the lockdown, the social distance measures will have, you know, potentially catastrophic economic and social results. So a lot of governments are mitigating the worst effects of one 
good policy um, with major investments. So we're seeing that. Um, we're also seeing, I think, a recognition that this is global and you can't protect your own people and you're not a good state and a good citizen if you're not reaching out to help others across the border. So gradually over the last two weeks, concerns about Africa, Asia, places where it's going to spread to in the next wave are coming. That's ethical. That's got to be right as well. Um, but I'm going to say no because I think we haven't quite got um, equity right. I think we're learning as we go. Everybody's learning who's going to be worst hit, how, you know, we've just discovered care homes in the last week in UK as a really vulnerable spot. Um, we're going to learn as we go around equity, but we must do that. And I think I have to say we were, all of all states perhaps not quick enough. Um, they didn't get COVID quickly enough. I think they've been preparing for the last 20 years for a major security terrorist crisis. They've not been preparing well enough for a pandemic. It's interesting to hear you say that you do think um, the Western or Northern countries are um, acting not only in protection of their own citizens, but in solidarity with the rest of the world. That was a question that came up from many listeners actually in advance uh, that they sent in to say, um, you know, how, how is this going to work when a lot of countries are, are focused domestically? So maybe that's something we can come back to. Um, before we go further, because I, I want to delve into some of the ethical dilemmas, but first wanted to hear from Jonas and, and Eva, you've just laid out kind of what, what, where you, what you're watching for, where your concerns are, um, and to hear from, from Jonas and Eva what the, the one as a way of kind of framing this conversation, the one thing that's keeping you up at night when it comes to being accountable um, to people affected by this crisis. So by means of introduction briefly, um, Jonas Habamina is joining us from Goma in Eastern DRC. Uh, can't imagine a better place or context through which to have this discussion. He is executive director of um, Bifert, which is a local NGO that does both peace building activities, but also provides humanitarian assistance um, to victims of armed conflict, but also uh, he was heavily involved in the response to Ebola uh, and, and now to COVID. Um, so Jonas, what, what worries you most when it comes to accountability in this response? Uh, Heba, thank you very much and welcome to everybody. Uh, when uh, we are speaking about accountability, for me, the most uh, activity should be based on uh, community engagement and they're working with uh, local partners. As you know, uh, the country have been facing to more crisis for a long time. Uh, for me, uh, accountability should be based on engaging communities and uh, using existing local capacities by building also government capacities, but most effort should be based on community engagement in terms of mobilization, in terms of using existing capacities, in terms of preparation, in terms of responding, and in terms of giving feedback to what humanitarian organizations are doing in the area. Thank you so much. We'll come back to engagement, as I mentioned off the top, um, and helpful to, to know that that's kind of the top of your priority list. Um, next, I'm going to turn to Eva Nida Berger who leads Oxfam's global work on public health promotion and, as it happens, specializes in community engagement. Um, Eva, what's top of your concern list? Thanks, Eva, and hi, everyone. I mean, there are many concerns which keep me up at night. Uh, particularly for me is the risk of exclusion of vulnerable and marginalized population groups because of access and accessibility issues and literacy barriers and also the risk of stigmatiza stigmatization and doing harm, for example, by the narrative which is used in the response. So very military orientated, which is fueling mistrust and also feeding misconceptions. Also um, potential lack of uh, data protection measures and following Jonas as well, the challenge around really designing and implementing meaningful community engagement processes for um, crisis affected people. So a range of issues there that I, I do hope we will touch on. Um, I, wa I want to come back to ethics to start with because um, that is uh, in many ways the, 
perhaps the most um, obvious, even outside of humanitarian settings, the most obvious uh, dilemma. And, and um, Hugo, I'm gonna hit you with a quick fire round of questions of, of how, I guess what you call distributive ethics, um, essentially in my um, plain language, prioritization, how you make some of those difficult choices. So the, the one most people would be familiar with, I suppose, who do you save if you can't save all COVID patients? And you, you argue that triage is ethical and it's the right thing to do. But one of the questions actually that came up in advance was how then do you protect the life or the dignity of elderly people against a, a COVID-19 ageist prejudice? What happens when one part of society becomes disposable, so to speak? How, who do you save? Well, I do believe in triage. I think we have to make that necessary choice at times. We're not going to be able to save everybody in certain situations. And I think the, the principle of capacity to benefit is a good one for treatment. I think you have to choose a person who has the real capacity to benefit from that treatment rather than a person who maybe doesn't um, have the strength and capacity to really benefit um, from that treatment. And survive from it. So you have to make that hard choice. And it's a, it's a right choice, I think. And I think the reason we know it's a right choice is that a lot of people in society would say, and I would be one of these, I'm pretty gray and old now, I would say, yes, um, it is more important that my son, my grandson, my, I haven't got a grandchild yet, but my child, whatever, younger people should um, live rather than me. I, I can relate to that. I understand that. Um, intuitively. So I think people can get behind that choice and they understand that. I think what we have to do about old people and you know Ava's point and yours about stigmatization, we have to say no they're not dispensable at all, they're incredibly precious, they've brought us into the world, they've created everything we have. Um, we have to look after them and therefore we have to say yes we have to do triage and treatment but we have to do compassionate, palliative, respectful care as well for the dying. And we have to make sure somehow they're comfortable and um, loved to the end. Uh, you, we were discussing this earlier and, and you were saying this is kind of a, a non-issue anyway, because in a place like South Sudan, you're not going to be deciding who to put on the ventilator because there are no ventilators. Um, and that it's a, it's a different kind of discussion. Um, so let's try to take it in that direction now. One of the other dilemmas, uh, and we at The New Humanitarian recently published um, an opinion article from an aid worker who felt the most responsible thing she could do was leave. In this case, it was Afghanistan. How do you balance the duty to stay and deliver with the principle of, of doing no harm when aid workers um, can be a burden on the health system of a country in which they're working, could contribute to spreading the disease? Um, or uh, equally the, the harm that's done to the aid workers themselves in terms of taking into account their own safety. How do you deal with that ethical dilemma? Well, you must, as aid agencies, try and stay and deliver, but you must do that as carefully as possible. So you must um, really make sure that your staff are protected and that you are really protecting communities as much as you can when you are engaging with them, working with them. But you must try and stay and deliver. Um, but you're, you're never gonna do no harm at all. And I'm afraid there will be sad cases in the next few months when um, the virus arrived via aid workers, aid issues, aid whatever, and there will be tragedies like that. Um, but we need therefore a culture of consent that aid workers are important, we want them to try and stay and deliver, whether they're local volunteers or members of big organizations or government. But sometimes it'll go wrong. Now, if it goes wrong because of negligence and carelessness, then we should take that seriously. But I think if it goes wrong as bad luck and accident, um, we need a low blame culture. And we still need to realize that in fact, um, we all want people trying to help. Um, the alternative is much worse. And that means our neighbors, whatever. So we must try and stay and deliver. We won't do no harm at all. It's impossible always, particularly in a big crisis like this. Next in my quick fire round, and, and um, I promise it won't go on forever, but I think these are the, the difficult questions that everyone is asking. And this one came up again from the audience in advance. How do you balance demand globally, especially in what we're now seeing, which is a, a real changing face of vulnerability? 
Um, is it ethical for the UK to send its doctors to help Yemenis when people are dying of COVID in London? Do you save the, the British people? Do you save the Yemeni people? How do you decide on where the resources should go? Yeah, and it's tricky that, and it's not a one-way uh, medical issue. It's not British and Yemeni. There are, you know, 44% of the National Health Service in the UK come from migrant uh, minority backgrounds. Um, we're seeing Sudanese doctors, um, Caribbean doctors, Indian Asian doctors dying, Pakistani doctors and nurses dying in the UK at the moment trying to treat treatment. So, I mean, I think what, what we need to focus on um, is really that states do have an ethical obligation and a legal obligation to protect their citizens first. They must do that. But of course, they also have global obligations to protect people everywhere. And everywhere is important in this uh, pandemic because protecting people everywhere is protecting your own people as well because it's such a spreading um, problem. So, you know, we must expect our states to do both. We must expect them to really engage together in effective global collective action um, to come up with global reach and help people across Africa, across Asia, if they're the British government, as well as here. Of course, finally, the, the key resource will be the vaccine or the retrovirals that actually cure and prevent this disease. Now, the moment they arrive, they are a really genuinely just solution to this problem because they can be rolled out to everybody. And that must happen extremely fast and that must become a moral imperative for everyone to make sure that everyone around the world has access to vaccine or retroviral, as in fact happens so effectively in the HIV pandemic. I don't know about that. I, we hosted a, a webinar um, of our own just at the, at the start of the crisis and we had Jeremy Kanundek, the former head of um, the US Office for Foreign Disaster Assistance, and he said, you know, when the, those first 100,000 vaccines come out, that is going to be a fight in terms of who gets them, and we're going to have to fight very hard to ensure it doesn't just go to those who can afford them. So uh, my bet is that um, that won't be the end of the, the ethical dilemmas. Um, all of this will be a struggle. We're going to be learning all the way, and there will be friction and conflict and tension, but, you know, that principle should stand, even if it doesn't happen immediately. One last question when it comes to these dilemmas. Um, every week we, we do a kind of roundup of the impact that COVID-19 is having on aid operations. Um, and in last week's, uh, a number of things struck me that I think are relevant to um, this debate. Coronavirus restrictions have derailed immunization campaigns. So um, illnesses from vaccine preventable diseases like polio, measles, cholera are all expected to rise in the coming weeks. More than 5,000 centers offering sexual and reproductive health care have closed in 64 countries because of the pandemic. Aid groups in Burkina Faso are unable to access those in need because of travel restrictions. Commercial and cargo flights coming in and out of CAR are suspended in a country where 70% of health services are provided by aid groups, and so on and so forth. Maybe most obviously um, shown by this example. In South Sudan, government hospitals are clearing out space in health facilities normally used to cure severely mal malnourished children to make space for COVID cases um, when uh, this severe acute malnutrition has a mortality rate of 21%. And now we're talking to your earlier point about young children. What is the ethics of that? What, what do you do when protecting people from COVID exposes them to potentially more threatening risks? Well, you don't just focus on COVID. That would be wrong. I mean, it's not more, people are not more important because they're dying of COVID than people who are dying in childbirth or malnutrition or measles. So we have to find somehow in this response, we have to find a balanced health portfolio, a balanced health system that engages with um, COVID and sets up separate isolation facilities as necessary, but also remains with people who have ordinary killer diseases ordinary illnesses which are as serious and that's going to be a challenge but we know um, from Ebola and others that the best thing to do is build a balanced health system and um, morally it would be wrong just to prioritize COVID patients. Um, again the capacity to benefit can be applied across all patient groups when you're in a situation of scarce resources so we must maintain parity between ordinary illnesses and COVID.
There are some, some questions in the chat box um, that are a bit linked to this that we're going to come to in a moment. So the question around, you know, the dilemma between um, protecting people from COVID and then exposing them to hunger when they stay home. Uh, we'll come to that with Jonas in just a minute. Um, and there's a question also about who decides with the triage. Um, but I'm, I'm going to actually put that question to you, Eva, because um, I, I see it as part of a, a wider challenge, which is in all of these ethical uh, choices that that have to be made. How do you involve um, the community to ensure that their input is taken into account in how you make these prioritizations? You've piloted and developed guidance on um, a number of, of community engagement um, projects in uh, hygiene promotion in particular and worked on the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone and in, in DRC. Um, so how, how to ensure that these choices are informed by the desires of the community. Yeah, I guess one key thing, and we know all very well about, is really to provide the access to the right information at the right time, alongside working with locally existing networks and asking those, including communities, what they need rather than making assumptions on their behalf. We know that communities do have their own coping mechanisms and that they also find their own solutions. So for example, in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak, um, we could see communities mobilizing themselves to construct isolation facilities because access to treatment and also timely arrival of ambulances was really, really challenging. Um, we also worked in Liberia with local community level task forces and a network of volunteers which were trusted by the community. And this really helped to share information, motivate people to seek treatment, but also bringing communities' concerns to external decision making for us. So there is a strong advocacy component. Um, and now drawing on these lessons learned, um, the teams in the Philippines, for example, are mapping in densely urban populated areas, um, local networks, including CP CEOs and women rights organizations, and then um, training them and also providing support to build trust and acceptability of response measures, but also advocating on their behalf. Yes, we also have to recognize that communities have many needs, um, such as food, water, or cash, uh, which may, may, might make it hard for them to prioritize preventive measures. So in this sense, um, one of the focus for now could, could be on the support of uh, community-led solidarity strategies. So for example, this could include support groups to, who are collecting water and food and other necessities for those most at risk. And we are also starting to explore with communities how to set up a sort of like simple coding system for homes which are self-isolating or in need of support. Um, so obviously this has to be context specific, but it could be about simply leaving an object by the door or writing a symbol on the wall. And this could also help to reduce physical contact between community members while also supporting access to basic services. And lastly, I think um, really supporting a community self-isolation strategies. So in many places, people are very well about who is at risk and um, also like respecting elderly population groups. So really asking them how, what are the best measures and strategies in their immediate environment to isolate those groups and keep them safe um, while they have access to information and basic um, services. One of the questions that's come up in the chat box is whether you still think it's ethical to do this kind of um, monitoring, evaluation, and accountability work when it means that field staff have to go into communities to collect the data. Um, and a number of questions came up in advance of, the, of this discussion around how you do community engagement um, effectively in the age of social distancing. I think humanitarians have, have done remote work um, in places like Somalia for years. But um, I think this is, is still a, a particular situation given its, its scale. So can you share with us some um, advice or best practice on how to do this work remotely uh, as well as in, in low-tech environments? You mentioned kind of writing a symbol on the wall, um, but what else are, are some techniques that um, aid workers can use to, uh, to ensure that they can reach people when there isn't the comms infrastructure, et cetera? Sure, um, and I guess like the preparedness stage here is really key and um, why there are several countries um, already under lockdown, 
there's quite a number of areas um, where we still have access to communities. So our key recommendation to our teams are really to start now using the window of opportunity to involve communities and local actors in risk analysis, preparedness and response planning. Um, safety equipment is equally important without like putting a physical barrier by wearing goggles or masks or an apron. So really making that culturally appropriate and discussing what is the best mean. And also um, one of the key um, priority activities should be mapping information and trusted information sources at community level. And also including in the provisions um, phones, credits or radios for sort of like community based communication focal points. So back in Beni DRC in early October 2018, when there were armed attacks and lockdowns, we maintained communication with focal points through SMS and phone calls and gave them practical advices and also mobilized other actors to, for example, provide uh, material for decontamination. So this reflected very well communities' agency as they knew what they need to do to contain the immediate risks. And our role in such a situation was really about linking them to other response actors and advocate for their support. Um, it could be also that um, we are using existing facilities and entry points. So for example, is there a mean to work with um, health uh, facility staff and conduct small um, surveys when patients are coming um, for treatment? So we really need to think um, creatively, but I think it shouldn't be any excuse, access shouldn't be any excuse of not implementing um, accountability and upholding accountability principles. Um, I, I see that there's a lot of demand um, in the, and then I'm trying to follow the chat at the same time, but for these guidelines and resources, and I think we will be able to, uh, Ava, share some of those with, with people after the, the webinar is over. Um, I want to turn to Jonas now because I think um, the, the reality in DRC epitomizes perfectly why these questions of community engagement that Eva has just been describing are so important. Um, you are in, in Goma in Eastern DRC, which has been home, as uh, we all know, to all kinds of problems from armed uh, violence to uh, Ebola. And we at the New Humanitarian have reported at, at length um, about the problems caused by the deep mistrust between communities and responders in the case of Ebola in DRC, which led um, to all kinds of problems to the response. Um, not only that people weren't following the basic uh, security protocols, but that in the end, there was in fact a conflict between um, the responders and the communities that they were meant to help. Um, we, we reported, in, for instance, on, on one case where um, in fact a, a, a man was shot to death um, by the patrols that were um, that were accompanying the Ebola responders. And so you can see where this can lead to when it's not um, dealt with properly. You went through that whole experience and now the first few cases of, of COVID-19 are emerging in Goma. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're hearing from your community. You've just done a survey of 200 households in Goma about their perceptions, their attitudes, their behaviors towards COVID. What are you finding? Thank you, Leba, for your question. Uh, we have done a survey one week ago uh, about uh, uh, the attitude and uh, uh, practices in communities in Goma City. Uh, we have seen that uh, during our survey, we have targeted 200 households in Goma City. But 50% uh, of communities don't have hand washing facilities in their homes. And the survey have showed that households don't have soap, they don't have uh, disinfection materials, people don't have protection materials in their homes. Uh, we have seen that many people don't have information about COVID-19. As you know, here we have opportunity to educate people through radio, uh, churches, schools, but all churches are closed here in Goma. Schools are also closed. Some people are giving information to radio, but we have seen that some households don't have radio in their house. What is the problem? 
But also, you have to know that uh, some people still considering that COVID-19 is not a problem. It doesn't happen. It's, it's not existing. And uh, people are saying that COVID-19 is not a reality. Uh, we have seen that 98% uh, of households don't have enough food in their house when the government have stopped any movement in the city. The government and the partners gave uh, measures that people need to stay home, but 1980% of households don't have enough food in their homes. This is a problem. When we were doing our assessment in Goma City, some of our households were, were asking us, are you going to give us food? Are you going to procure water for drinking? Are you going to give us disinfection materials? How are you going to support us during this hard period of COVID-19? So th this speaks exactly to uh, one of the questions that came up, which is that in, in many rural areas in developing countries, the rural poor are choosing between dying of hunger because they have to stay home um, or dying of infection because they risk going to work. What, based on the, the results that you, you found in your survey, what are you recommending to the government, to those who are coordinating the humanitarian response in terms of how they should approach that, that dilemma? Thank you, Heba. After we have done our survey, now we are working with the World Health Organization to push and influence them to see how they can be more flexible in their programming. The result we have seen, now we are using them to influence World Health Organization, Cluster, here in Goma and some other organization, to see how they can be more flexible, how they can change their programming. Also, we have discussed with some NGOs here in Goma who have seen that it could be better to use the cash transfer mechanism in COVID-19 response. So cash transfer should be a solution to build uh, livelihood of those people who don't have food in their homes. Also, you have to understand that uh, here in Goma, people don't have to stay home because they need to go surround to see how they can survive. People are living by doing cash for work here in Goma. More than 50% we have seen in Goma, they don't have a job, they're not, they are not employed. They need to go outside for looking for how they can survive. So we have seen that uh, a solution should be also based on uh, doing a programs based on livelihood by developing resilience of communities and also to see how uh, how livelihood and uh, resilience aspects should be integrated in uh, the programming. But also, we think that based on what you have seen in different houses, economic issues should be considered when people are applying for doing COVID-19 responses. Economic model, a humanitarian program based on building economic and livelihood capacities should be a solution to prevent COVID-19 in Goma City. This, this speaks to um, another, now it sounds like, Hugo, all you do is write for the new humanitarian, but another uh, op-ed that you published um, on, on TNH yesterday, in fact, I think, called uh, Moral Multitasking, in which you, you call on humanitarians to, you know, do more than one thing at once, and that a business model around supporting economic uh, activity and jobs becomes more and more important. So that, that resonates a lot um, with what Jonas is saying. Uh, Jonas, I just wanted um, to, to ask you one kind of final question on this. Based on your experience with Ebola, what are the consequences to your mind if responders don't consider these wider needs as expressed by the community around livelihood, et cetera? What would the, what would the consequence be of um, a response that doesn't take that into account? Thank you, Heba, for your question. As you have done our survey in Goma, if 
the government, if donors and uh, implementer partners are not integrating livelihood and uh, economic model in their responses, we have seen that the crisis should be a big problem in the region and we should have a catastrophic situation. As people are going outside, we have seen some policemen beating people in different areas, for example, in Kinshasa and here in Goma. So we are thinking that uh, if humanitarian organization, those who are responding, if they don't integrate livelihood issues, building local capacities, bringing to those people who don't have water, water, bringing food to those who don't have, we should have a catastrophic situation in Goma. And the risk should be high for those households who are most vulnerable to the COVID-19. And we should have loss of many people in the area. I, I said last question, but I have one more question that's just come up in the chat box um, because you're also the, the focal point for the sphere standards um, in Eastern DRC. And, and someone is asking, you know, these sphere standards have been developed through extensive consultation and are the most widely used humanitarian standards. What can be done to use the sphere standards as, as a way of leveling the, the field, making it more equal when it comes to accountability and ethics? Um, and I would just add, particularly if people don't even have water at home, you know, and the standards are suggesting however many liters uh, a day, you know, when do the standards become irrelevant in a sense because the reality is so, so far from that? Okay, uh, with sphere standards, uh, as you say, we have already done something as a, a sphere for here in DRP because we have trained more than 200 people from different organizations on sphere standards. During the COVID-19 period, sphere team has developed a sphere standard adapted to the COVID-19 context. We received all those tools and we have shared all these tools with different clusters here in DRC. We have shared all these tools with the humanitarian organization here in Congo, but we are continually pushing, educating NGOs, educating partners to respect sphere standards as possible and also increasing accountability when they are doing their programming and their implementation uh, in the area. But you know, we have also doing, we have done many advocacy um, things because the UNHCR have integrated the CHS uh, under the uh, HRP, the Humanitarian Response Plan to the country level. And also different clusters, we met with them, we discussed, we have done some presentations, we have discussed more about sphere standards and the nine commitment in the uh, core humanitarian standards. So we are pushing, we are interesting people, we are doing many issues about uh, how people can respect sphere standards and the CHS during the implementation. Um, I'm, 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 as you can see, trying to weave the questions in as we go. So I will come to localization in just a minute. But before we move on, um, when it comes to kind of engagement, um, I, I want to talk specifically about complaints mechanisms, which is, of course, part of the wider, um, wider kind of uh, feedback and engagement, um, uh, you know, um, portfolio, but uh, a rather specific one. Um, and in particular, there was a question around how you handle um, safeguarding and, uh, of course, sexual abuse in this kind of context. I wonder, Eva, if you have any suggestions on how um, safeguarding can be carried out in a situation like this. Um, the question was also linked on, you know, uh, this kind of situation allows predators to thrive, um, both, I suppose, within and, and outside of the aid system, but how, how do you do safeguarding and, and a complaints mechanism in an effective way in this kind of context? Okay. Uh, based on what you have uh, seen in different areas during our consultations, during our trainings on sphere standards, uh, during our training on CTS, we have seen that analyzing a context should be most key things to be done. Partners need to do a clear and a serious context analysis when we have to apply complaint mechanism. I think the context analysis should be 
the first thing to be done because we have seen that there are organizations who have developed a strong complaint mechanism, but there are many, many consequences and many problems when uh, uh, NGOs are developing strong complaint mechanism in different areas. A context analysis should be a key, most thing to be done before adapting the complaint mechanism in the region. Eva, anything to add from your vantage point? Yeah, I would second uh, Jonas' point on the context analysis. I think it's really um, mapping the risks around safeguarding. So is it because like uh, now um, we may recruit quicker, more people in certain areas, so we won't have time to do a proper assessment of uh, new partners. So what, what could be the potential risk and how could they mitigate that? We haven't yet all the answers, but again, um, with Broxham at least, with many um, staff, volunteers and partner organizations we are working, um, those are quite a, a lot of established relationships and there was like previous training and orientation on safeguarding policies and um, consent forms, etc. So um, we, we are not starting entirely from scratch, why we are also um, trying to understand what could be potential risks and how to mitigate that, why we are learning as we are going. I think just to make one point about um, remote complaint mechanisms. So obviously it is a huge challenge because generally people do prefer face-to-face -face interactions over more formal uh, mechanisms such as hotline or SMS. Um, in the context of COVID-19 now, it's really important to use like multiple channels and really also use a simple language, making sure that staff who are handling complaints and feedbacks are trained. Um, well enough to, to follow up and also speak local languages, which is sometimes not uh, the case. So in, in DRC, um, we have been quite successfully testing a tool which is called the Community Perception Tracker using a mobile device to understand communities' perceptions, concerns, um, but also misconceptions, obviously, around the disease and uh, the outbreak response. We have now adapted the tool to the COVID-19 um, situation and we roll it out in several countries and so for example in Burkina Faso and in Car, we are working with community-based staff and volunteers um, who have received the training um, and they will receive as well the communication means to sort of like report to us um, trends and fears and coping mechanisms of communities which will then be recorded remotely um, by staff who have connectivity. Obviously, there are many loopholes and layers into it. It's not the perfect solution, um, but a start uh, to really kind of like capture what communities are thinking and going through and giving an opportunity to make timely adjustments to our program activities. I did the forget to unmute thing. Um, I'm conscious that we only have a few minutes, so I would like to turn to uh, localization in the time we have left um, and maybe come back to you, Hugo. Uh, everything that, that Jonas and, and Eva have been describing now is for all intents and purposes, the localization agenda coming to life and yet perhaps um, not out of, you know, uh, a genuine desire to finally make it happen, but because uh, there is no other choice. Um, so with that, the huge, momentum around this agenda, but for not necessarily the right reasons, where do you see the opportunities and the, and the risks when it comes to localization and COVID? Well, I think there are a lot of opportunities and I hope we will see a sort of acceleration in localization from um, this COVID emergency because this is a, an emergency that affects everyone and therefore everyone must be involved in the response. And I think what, you know, we've been talking for many years now about the principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence. I think we've now got to really lift up the other principle of voluntary service, because what we're seeing, what I'm seeing around me in UK now, what we're seeing, we always see in, in Africa and Asia, is an extraordinary level of voluntary uh, response, mutual aid, neighborhood schemes, etc. We have to really value these, and I think big formal agencies need to get behind those schemes as much as possible and support those um, volunteer-based local networks, um, you know, because of exactly what Ava and Jonas have been saying, that, you know, communities must take charge of their own isolation, their own response, their own income, etc. So I think it's a good moment. Um, just thinking historically, I mean, it's often said that the great plague, the so-called, you know, the plague that hit Europe um, in the 14th century or 13th, I'm not sure which, um, 
did a lot to sort of abolish feudalism in many ways. So maybe that will happen in, in, in our sector as well, and that we'll see um, the rise of new structures, new forms, which really challenge traditional uh, formal structures. That's an analogy I have not heard before. Jonas, from your point of view on the ground, uh, to what extent is um, uh, locally led response the reality? Who, who is really leading the COVID response in, in Goma? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heba. Uh, now, you, you know, uh, the government, the ministry, the health ministry and the World Health Organization are leading the response now. But as you know, um, in DRC, there are traditional donors like USAID and DFID who are giving small grants in terms of responding to crisis. But now, most of countries where DFID is based and the USAID is based are now affected. And now we don't have to be waiting for those donors coming from UK, coming from USA, US, and hope that they will give funding to respond to the crisis. So now we are seeing that national NGOs are on the front line now. They're educating people. They're trying to do what they can do when they don't have enough resources in terms of responding. Local NGOs are now on front line. They are using local existing capacities. They are doing what they can do in terms of preventing the risk from COVID-19. They are mobilizing the community to be more prepared and how they can be more resilient in terms, in terms of responding to the COVID-19 crisis. But you have to know that all these years, uh, local communities were seeing people coming and responding to crises. There are communities who are still complaining that international NGOs and the UN agencies don't bring any change in the context of Congo. So I can appreciate that uh, uh, localization should be more activated in terms of supporting local existing NGOs who are able to mobilize people, to help communities in terms of preparation, to use local existing capacities in terms of preventing COVID-19 and some other disease and crisis in the region. I think there are a number of um, ethical concerns that that raises as well around, uh, as some have pointed to in the questions box, um, you know, risk transfer, retaliation against local groups, but also how local uh, aid workers are accountable to the population as well. Unfortunately, we won't have time to get into all of that, but I am gonna just ask um, each of the panelists for in one sentence, really one closing um, thought on amid all of these competing um, priorities and these ethical dilemmas, you know, if we're a bit realistic, uh, we won't be able to, to be, have a perfect response in all cases. What is the minimum kind of acceptable outcome that humanitarians should be aiming for in this, in this environment if, if we are to accept, as, as you argue, Hugo, that human ethics has, has not yet found a perfect way to treat everyone equally and well, what is acceptable? What is good enough? Maybe I can start with you, Hugo. Yes, I think it's very important that um, we don't compromise too much in this area of community engagement and accountability. I think we should keep our standards high and we're going to have to adapt and innovate to um, meet this challenge. But we must still try and have the same standards. Eva. So I guess from my point of view, it would be about like really continue um, to share accurate information in the right language, um, recognize and support local capacity and solution, which is alongside also providing much more flexible funding um, for local organizations and easier means to access this funding. And the last word to you, Jonas. In, in what the humanitarian community should try to prioritize among all of these ethical dilemmas. Can you hear us, Jonas? I think we may have lost him for the moment. So uh, I will turn to you, Jules. I, I know we're just about out of time to wrap things up. Thanks very much.
Well, thank you so much, Heba and uh, Hugo, Ava, and Jonas. What a dynamic discussion on critical issues for us at this time in the humanitarian sector. Uh, thank you all to the participants uh, for engaging with the Q&A um, and uh, dynamic discussion um, because of your engagement. Uh, we will be taking up these questions and uh, will summarize uh, this time together today and share the recording um, and hope to have another opportunity in the future to go deeper on some of these issues with some of you um, through other means, whether through our different community of practices or uh, through additional webinars. So we wish you all good health and um, stay safe out there. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.